guys, today we're going to be talking about the hydrologic cycle, also called the water cycle. Um, and again, we want to focus on this idea that one of the biggest things that affects weather and climate both is this idea of precipitation. So that's, of course, part of the water cycle. So remember that that can take a whole bunch of different forms, um, but this really is going to determine what types of things can live in certain areas. Now the patterns that we see in precipitation are going to depend on a lot of different things, um, including those wind and pressure patterns that we talked about last class, as well as ocean currents, the topography of the land, like um, whether there are mountains and things like that, how the land changes as you go on. So we're going to talk about that more today. Uh, so this water cycle is super important um, in terms of ecosystem services because it is going to kind of manage all the water on Earth, collect it, purify it, redistribute it all over the planet. Um, it's all powered by solar radiation and the cycling itself is caused by those temperature and pressure changes and convection currents that we've been discussing so far. So here's an overview of the water cycle. I like this diagram because it does kind of include most of the important things. So usually when you've heard of this in the past, you're probably just thinking of three major things. Um, evaporation of the water off of the land or the ocean, c it condensing then into clouds, and then precipitation, it falling back down as rain. Uh, but it can actually be a lot more complex than that, and we want to make sure that we're incorporating all the different parts uh, that are actually happening here. So first I want to address the difference between three major topics here, evaporation, transpiration, and sublimation. So these are all ways that the water is coming up into the atmosphere, uh, but they're all a little different. So evaporation is what happens, what most of you think of as the water coming up into the atmosphere. It's what happens when that solar radiation heats up the liquid water, makes the molecules start moving quite a bit more, and then because of that, they are able to free themselves um, and turn into a gas, turn into water vapor. Um, and since that gas is less dense, it's going to rise up into the atmosphere. Now, one thing that is important to understand is that cold air is going to hold less water than warm air, and this also goes along with that idea that the warm air is probably going to cause more evaporation because the molecules are moving more in a warm substance. Whereas evaporation is turning from a liquid to a gas, sublimation is just a little bit different in that it's going from a solid to a gas. So this is going to happen more in at the poles, where you have that water tied up as snow or ice, but you still do get snowfall and rainfall. And the reason for that is it's subliming um, instead of evaporating. And then we have transpiration. And this often gets ignored, but it's actually one of the most important ways that water gets uh, transferred back to the atmosphere. So basically transpiration is when water is uh, moving up and evaporating from the leaves of plants. So the water gets taken up by the plant roots. It travels upwards through the xylem of the plant uh, by capillary action and it gets released through these cells called stomata in their leaves. And this is so important because 90% of the water that comes off of land areas is actually coming off through the process of transpiration not through straight evaporation. Um, so you may want to pause it here for a second, kind of review this process. You should hopefully remember from biology these concepts of cohesion and adhesion, which make this capillary action possible. Um, you can see here, these are, this is an electron micrograph of the stomata cells in the plants, and these have guard cells in them that allow them to open and close so that they can let out more or less water depending on their own needs. But again, this is where a lot of that water in the atmosphere is coming from. So, okay, so we've t covered the ways that it's coming up into the atmosphere. Now let's talk about some of the things that's happening to it afterwards. So, of course, after y you have things evaporate and condense into clouds up here, um, you will see some precipitation happening. So, one of the things that goes along with this idea um, is the idea of dew point, and this is also called the saturation point. Basically, this is the point when the air is holding its maximum amount of water, it can't hold any more. And at this point, your evaporation rate is going to be equal to your cond condensation rate. So the water is condensing as soon as it evaporates. 
if your air temperature drops below this point, then something has to happen to that water. So it's going to start to condense and you're going to get either fog or clouds and it depends on altitude um, which of those two you'll get. So if you're up high you'll get clouds, if you're closer to the ground you'll get fog. Um, if there is enough of this condensation happening and there's enough water in the air then this can lead to precipitation of some kind. It might just be dew, it might be rain, anything like that. When this precipitation falls, it falls in certain areas that we call watersheds. So watersheds are determined by topography or how high off the ground you are. Um, and they tend to run from the highest ridges. So you can see it's the very upward boundaries of the mountains. And then of course water flows with gravity. So it's going to flow down from those high areas into tributaries, small streams, and then into larger rivers and eventually out into the ocean. But the watershed is really just the area where that precipitation falls that drains into the larger body of water. So we'll come back to this and go into much more detail as the year goes on, but for now just try to be familiar with the word. All right, so once that precipitation falls, it has to go somewhere. And there's three major things, really kind of two major things that happen to it. Um, either it runs off, literally run off, um, it flows over the surface until it enters one of those stream systems or tributaries, um, and that will help it replenish those streams, lakes, ponds, things like that, so that the water levels stay constant. Uh, the other thing that is uh, sometimes a concern with ru runoff, uh, but it can be a good thing too, it carries nutrients with it as it goes since water is such a great universal solvent. It dissolves a lot of things, can also dissolve pollutants in it and bring it with it. Um, it takes sediments as well and can actually move quite a bit of land around and cause erosion. Um, so good and bad, but important part of the whole cycle. Um, if the water doesn't run off over the surface, then it's going to infiltrate or seep down into the soil. Uh, and then there's a couple things that can happen to it. It might evaporate if it stays close to the surface. It might go right back out again into the atmosphere, or it could join a stream system or the groundwater. If it does make it down into the groundwater, this is a complex system underground. You can kind of think of it almost like an underground water system with rivers um, and uh, big bodies of water that we call aquifers instead of calling it like a lake or a pond. Uh, but it's the same sort of idea. And again, we'll come back to all this a lot more later on in the year. Um, what you need to know for now is just that when water does seep in, it does eventually make it down to the groundwater. And that's really good enough. All right, so all of this precipitation eventually is going to wind up in the oceans. And when we talk about the oceans, we tend to split them up to make it easier for ourselves. But it's really important to understand that it's actually one big continuous body of water. Um, so if we do uh, kind of split them up, we can see that the P Pacific Ocean is our largest division. Um, it actually takes up about a third of Earth's surface and holds about half of all of Earth's water. Um, so when we talk about where our water cycle is being most influenced, a lot of times it will be in that area. There are a lot of things that affect how water circulates in the ocean. Um, so one of these things is the Coriolis effect, and we talked about that last class, right? So in the case of ocean currents, it's going to cause the currents in the northern hemisphere to turn clockwise and the currents in the southern hemisphere to turn counterclockwise. Again, for all the same reasons we talked about last time. And then there are two other major factors that are going to influence that circulation. The position of those land masses, the continents, and also differences in temperature and salinity. So when we look at currents, usually we're looking at surface currents, which are known as gyres. Um, and these are basically those circular currents that are moving clockwise or counterclockwise. They're caused by the prevailing winds that we talked about last time, pushing around that surface water. And they're also deflected off of the air ma uh, the um, sorry land masses. So you can see where they start to move when they hit land. Um, so for example, the trade winds around the equator uh, here are blowing towards the west. 
um, and the westerlies are blowing towards east, and that causes this current right here, our North Atlantic Equatorial Current. So it's the winds that are really causing these currents. Uh, the, now those are on the surface. We also have deeper currents, uh, which are caused by the vertical mixing of ocean water. And basically how this happens is salt water is really way more dense and cold water is much more dense until you get to about four degrees Celsius, at which point it starts to form ice, which we know is less dense and floats. Uh, but anyway, the cold, salty water is going to sink because of its density. Uh, and this happens close to the poles, because of course that's going to be where the coldest water is. Um, that sinks down below the warm, less salty water, which is the water that's flowing off of land from all of that runoff. And the action of this cold, salty water sinking and this warm, less salty water rising causes what we call the ocean conveyor, which is a deep ocean current driven by these density and temperature differences. It goes all around the world. Um, and one thing that you'll notice is that the warm water does not follow the same pattern as the cold water, and that's actually because the Coriolis effect is even more pronounced at this greater depth. So they're going to follow different patterns. Um, the most important thing to understand about this is the Gulf Stream. The Gulf Stream carries all this warm water up to Europe. And if you look at where England is, it's level with parts of northern Canada. It would be very, very cold without this Gulf Stream that's helping to warm it up and bring precipitation to this area. Another thing that happens is called upwelling. This is when the cold, nutrient-rich water comes up from the bottom of the oceans along the coastline, and it brings nutrients up with it. This kind of fertilizes the water, and this leads to really high biological productivity, which means that it's going to be a really great fishing ground. So the fishing industry depends on that. And this is partly because of the strong trade winds that are pushing the warm water away and allowing that cold water to take its place. So when you put all this together, you get your ocean conveyor developing throughout the world. And this is going to cause a lot of the important weather patterns that we look at. So as the ocean interacts with the atmosphere through these winds and currents interaction, you're going to get drier areas and you're going to get cooler areas, warmer areas, wetter areas. Um, basically, what this comes down to is that idea of specific heat that we looked at today, that water takes a lot more energy to change temperature than land. And because of that, the closer you are to the ocean, the more stable your temperatures are going to be. So the interaction of those surface winds and those convection cells that we talked about last time is actually going to cause certain patterns in different areas. Um, the air at the equator is uplifting, that warm, moist air because of the trade winds, and that's going to lead to heavy rainfall near the ocean in, in equatorial areas. Um, more water is evaporating because you have higher temperatures because of more direct sunlight. And then the prevailing winds are going to start to blow that over land masses. The land masses are even warmer. That causes it to rise up more and be more likely to condense and fall down as rain. Then as we go over the continent, that air is going to get drier. So one of the causes of this is called the rain shadow effect which is basically that near the windward side of a continent, which is the direction the wind blows from, um, th the rainfall tends to be heavy. And then in more inland, you tend to get less rain, drier areas. This is partly because you usually have mountains somewhere nearby, and those force the air to rise, and it cools and condenses into water vapor, and then it falls down as rain um, on that windward slope. Then as the wind moves down the other side, it's already dry. It begins to warm even more. Any water that's left evaporates. So you get these desert areas in the rain shadow of the mountain many times. One of these... Uh, one of the things that is affected by this is monsoons. Monsoons are seasonal changes that happen in both the winds and the precipitation patterns because of the differences in solar radiation that you So basically in the summer, when you have really direct solar radiation, it's going to cause these areas of low pressure to develop over the hot land surfaces. And then all that water coming in off of the ocean is going to cause huge downpours here with these monsoons. In the winter, the opposite happens. You have that cold land surface, and that's going to cause the water to move out over the ocean. So areas in this monsoon region actually experience both wet and dry seasons, depending 
on the temperature. Here's just another explanation of that. So next class, come in ready to put this all together, and we'll actually talk about how deserts form as a result of this. And I will see you again next week.